الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين Respected elders, scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. In our discussion on the Hajj Masail, we've said that we need to uh, remind ourselves that Hajj is a unique once in a lifetime experience which has the power to transform ourselves permanently. And therefore, it is a great opportunity not to be wasted without proper preparation and planning. And we also say that as a duty from God, it is the right of God on the whole of mankind, irrespective of whether they are believers or disbelievers. So long as they are human beings, it is the right of God on them to come and make hajj. Hajj as an expression of the obedience and submission to the one true Lord, that collective expression of belief in Tawheed, according to the message of the last messenger and the message of the previous messengers. And we said this duty becomes incumbent not on every individual, but only on those who have the uh, health ability they're not sick or old or weak or infirm they have the uh, the wealth capacity they can afford the trip and pay for the expenses of their dependents uh, in their absence and can pay the return expenses and can restart their normal lives once they're back and then number three uh, once they are able and financially capable then also there should be no restrictions for the path of traveling. And we also say that in order to ensure that our actions and rituals are performed according to the sunnah of the Prophet and the guidance of the Ahlul Bayt salam, we must make sure that we follow the expert opinion of the Mujtahid. And we also say that but if there is a difference of opinion amongst the mujtahids, then we need to make sure that the one we make the qaleed of is the a'lam. And once the capability, financial capability, has been uh, ensured, then it is haram to do anything to disable oneself by wasting away or spending away rightly or wrongly for halal purpose or otherwise the funds that had been accumulated for the sake of Hajj. So we came and stopped there. One more important reminder. According to uh, Masala number 41 about the rituals of Hajj, the Mujtahids tell us that not only should you have enough funds to go, but those funds should be enough to make sure that you can complete the rituals once you have gone, once you have arrived in Medina and uh, Mecca and Arafah and Mina and Muzdalifah and back. So, if for some reason the funds or the property of a person, the Hajji, is destroyed or lost in his country before he travels, he kept, he made he made sure that up until the time of traveling it should be available but unavoidably it got destroyed not that he squandered it away or during the journey beginning part middle part or last part the funds get lost or they get destroyed then now Hajj is not wajib on them Kwanini, Kwasababu Hajj is wajib if you're financially capable you were capable before you started your journey. You were capable as you were making the journey, halfway in the journey or just before the completion of the journey. Unavoidably, beyond your control, the funds got lost. So now it means, therefore, you cannot complete the Hajj and therefore the Hajj is not wajib anymore. Therefore, you're not sinful by leaving the Hajj. Of course, there's a procedure of how to come out of Ihram midway. However, if 
an accident arises. But this accident was not by your deliberate negligence. It was an incident that occurred and was beyond your control. Somebody else's property was destroyed in that accident. And therefore now, by law, you are liable to pay the damages. If you're going to pay the damages, then you can't go for Hajj. No problem. In that case, Hajj is no longer wajib because this was beyond your control. This is after you got the funds. However, scenario number three, you got the necessary funds, the Hajj is wajib, but up until the time of traveling for Hajj, you try to maintain it. Then during the Hajj season, not by accident, but by purpose, this person does something by negligence, which causes the destruction of the property and the funds in this situation no hajj is wajib though you don't have the funds now and you're already on the trip but the hajj is still wajib so if you can't do it this year you must make sure that you will redo the hajj next year as soon as possible in whatever manner possible then because by negligence you lost the money and therefore as a punishment you'll have to make sure next year you go back for hajj even if it is below the cost of an uh, of a of a decent luxurious uh, full facility uh, hajj even if you have to undergo difficulty still it is wajib to go for hajj however scenario number four before the season of hajj the funds were available you made sure up until the season of hajj the funds remained available during the trip you protected the funds so you managed to do the hajj hajj is over now You've completed uh, Arafah, Muzdalifah, Mina rituals and Makkah rituals. Now you want to return. In those last few days on return, the remaining funds to enable you to come back have gotten lost. So now here you may have to borrow, you may have to beg. It's not wajib to borrow to complete the Hajj if it gets lost earlier. Hajj is no longer wajib. Here the Hajj is finished. But the money is lost. In that case, no, the Hajj is valid. Even if you have to borrow, you'll, you can pay back, no problem. But you don't have to repeat the Hajj. So now the person has been called by God. <coughs> and the person, therefore, is an invited guest of God. He has the necessary health and the wealth. And the path is open and the caravan is available to provide the facilities. Being the guest of all, the all-merciful Lord, we must realize one very important thing, that my capability, my uh, ability to go for Hajj, is it my own acquired capability? Or no, the higher power God has capacitated me. I'm trying to clarify the concept of this Duyufur Rahman, to be the guest of God how the host arranges for the guest to come right from step one so you say that i've got their necessary wealth and therefore hajj has become wajib or no somebody has enriched you to qualify you to now make the wajib hajj trip or you say that i have the necessary health to be able to go for Hajj. It's your effort to make the necessary health or some the higher power has invigorated and strengthened you to be able to undertake this journey. And therefore you're a guest. So you say, I want to go for Hajj because I have enough time. Even if I leave now, I'll be able to make it on time. Is this your own effort or no? The higher power has enabled you so you say Hajj is wajib because there are no restrictions. I can easily get a flight, I can get my visa done, I can get my uh, hotel accommodation and all the necessary uh, transport and accommodation uh, facilities. Is that the reason or no? On a deeper and higher level, the higher power has cleared away all the obstructions for traveling. Oh, you say, I am healthy and I'm wealthy and able and the path is open, but there's an emergency I need to attend to. Oh, or there's another priority I need to attend to. 
But if there is no such priority, therefore Hajj is wajib. Is that of your doing? Or no, the higher power has made sure you're unclogged and there are no other obstacles preventing you from undertaking this trip. So you say that everything is ready. Some people, uh, everything is provided for, but they're not willing. They simply don't have the readiness. They're inhibited. Is that the case or no? The grace and the mercy and the rahmah from Allah to motivate and this inspire this person is not available because this person has done something to disqualify himself or herself. And finally, you say, there's a wonderful uh, several caravans offering facilities. It's decent, it's comfortable. Compare, just ask, ask your uh, elders and relatives and friends in the past how they were undergoing the difficulties of Hajj and then compare it with the facilities being provided now. So is it the facility that was provided by these caravans on day one or no? Allah is the one who has arranged for this facilitation. In conclusion, if Ibrahim salam was ordered by God to make an announcement to mankind that you should come for Hajj, if the Holy Prophet Sallallahu in the 10th year of Hijrah sent his announcer and messenger to, to call people to come for Hajj and for the rest of history, for all of mankind, this call has been made. Not only are we being called to go for Hajj, but as a guest, the overwhelming, uh, absolute, all kind, all merciful, all powerful host, God is enabling us to become a guest. Therefore, I should thank Allah right from the beginning for this wonderful opportunity that I have been granted. If it is an opportunity that has been granted, we should realize, therefore, where we are going. The first stop that we will make is in the holy city of Medina. So we thank Allah, therefore, we'll get the chance of visiting the holy places of the Messenger of God, the holy place where his great companions or indeed some of his greatest companions also lived and died. We will also be enabled to visit some historical places where the verses of Quran were revealed, where the miracle of God was being performed, as for example in the battle of Uhud, which is just outside Medina. It's a wonderful once in a lifetime opportunity, so remember that on this trip you may meet people in the caravan, in other caravans, from other countries, people whom perhaps you'll never be able to meet again ever in your lifetime. And therefore you'll get a unique once in a lifetime to, to change them by speaking something, by doing something, by sharing something with them, or no, by learning from them and the blessing that Allah has given them. And you can do that in different ways, in a small way, in a big way, in the biggest possible manner. You can change somebody's life forever. It's a unique opportunity. All of this, of course, will depend on how we behave there, which will depend on how we feel, which will depend on how we think. So therefore, we need to set the right mental attitude, which is that I am a guest of God who has been graced by God to go for this trip. And I can change myself and I can change others depending on how much I prepare myself to get from God. God is unlimited in His giving. The question is, how much do, am I open and willing to take from Him? So to the extent that we are ready to put in our time for the preparation for Hajj, our energy for the planning for Hajj, our skills and abilities, to that extent Allah will grant us, to that extent we will be enabled to change ourselves and to change others. And remember, this is a chance we are getting to visit some of the holiest places on the earth, to visit some of the most blessed places which can give us the chance of becoming a medium and opportunity to receive the best of the graces of God. 
And therefore, at the end of the trip, we definitely should become a better person and we should leave this world a better place than we found it. All of this depends on how we prepare for this trip. Therefore, before we will start the Wajib Hajj, we will be performing the Mustahab Ziyara of visiting the holy city of Medina. So a quick reminder of how to avail and benefit from this opportunity. This Mustahab is not Wajib, but it's highly recommended. As a basic principle, the holiness and the blessed character of the holy city of Medina or basically any other holy city depends on the person, the holy person who is buried there or who lived there or who settled there. So in Surah Balad, chapter 90, ayah number 1, Allah says, La bismillahir rahmanir rahim la uqsimu bihadhal balad and I swear by this city. Of course, here it is referring to Makkah. This surah is a Makki surah. And I swear by this city, or no, a more accurate translation is, I don't swear by this city because I don't need to swear by this city. The, the blessed nature and the holiness of this city is very clear. Makkah. Kwanini, the holiness and the blessedness of this city is very clear. Because you, the Prophet ﷺ, is living in this city. Otherwise, right now, this city is populated by the mushrikeen, the idol worshippers. That is not the reason this city is holy. It's because of your presence, O Holy Prophet, that makes this city, the city of Makkah, holy. And I swear by the Father and the Son, by the Holy Prophet and the successes after him. So if Makkah is holy because of the Holy Prophet, well likewise the city of the Prophet Medina to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa is holy, it's blessed, it's pure, it's sanctified because of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Imam Malik, uh, the head of the Mazhab Maliki Madhab has got an interesting uh, response. There's a debate amongst the scholars. Uh, Makkah is holy. Medina is holy. These are Haramain Sharifain. Of the two, which is the holier? Is it Makkah because of the Kaaba and Masjid al Haram? Or is it Medina because of Masjid al Nabi and the burial of the Holy Prophet? Malik replies that no, according to me, it's the city of Medina. And the reason he says is because every spot in the holy city of Medina is sanctified because the Holy Prophet ﷺ walked there, lived there, and breathed in that place. And Jibreel السلام, also descended with the message from Allah on different, at different times, on different occasions, for different reasons as guidance for the Prophet and guidance for the Muslimin. So Medina is holy because of the Holy Prophet Of course, somebody can argue with Malik Samahani, but uh, the Prophet lived only 13 years out of 63 years in Medina. 50 years! He was in Mecca. So if you're telling us Medina is holy because of the Prophet, well, the Prophet lived 50 years in Mecca before he came to Medina. Both of them are holy because of the Holy Prophet And therefore, one of the highly recommended acts in Medina is to make ziyarah of the Prophet and after the Prophet, the holy progeny of the Prophet In fact, in fact, before going for Hajj to pay respect to the Prophet and his holy progeny is necessary in order to validate the correctness of the Hajj. Kwanini Kusababu. Think about this. We are not a Muslim if we don't say Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. That's what the Prophet taught us. وَأَشَهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ 
Well, he is Rasulullah only at his time, or he's Rasulullah till the end of time, and he's Rasulullah even today. If he's Rasulullah till today, until the end of time, I have to be honest and sincere and genuine to accept him as the God appointed authority for my guidance, even today. And that I do in Medina, in his presence. If he is a prophet for all times, including our times, therefore I, I must declare my loyalty and my readiness to obey the prophet and the prophet's teachings all the time. Otherwise, I'll be misguided. God has sent the prophet. Had it not been for his dispatch of the messenger, mankind would have been lost. Yes, I can worship God according to what I think. But that according to what you think is exactly the thinking of shaitan. Shaitan was asked to make sajda to Adam, the God appointed representative on the earth. Shaitan says, I want to worship you and you alone. Why are you asking me to do sajda and to obey and to follow and to submit myself to this uh, representative of yours? I want to worship you. Allow me to worship you the way I want. And Allah says, no. <laughs> you can't worship the way you want. You worship through my chosen representative on the earth. So if I want my hajj to be sahih, accepted, therefore rewarded, therefore to transform me here, therefore to qualify me to receive uh, protection from the fire of hell and damnation and therefore to be allowed entry into Jannah if I want my Hajj to do all these things for me I must accept the teachings and the guidance of the Holy Prophet even today and therefore I must do the Hajj according to his method and not what I think is correct in fact after the Holy Prophet he by God's instruction he appoints his successor and therefore we take the guidance about the sunnah of the prophet from his appointed successors otherwise we are arrogating to ourselves an authority which belongs to god and god alone god is the one who appoints his divine representative not human beings this would be shirk to say i can also choose who should become the leader who can take me to god after the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and interestingly enough the Hajj that was performed was not that the Prophet sat in Medina and he told them this is what you're supposed to do please proceed go to Masjid Shajara enter into the state of Ihram go to Mecca do the Tawaf this is what you're supposed to do no the Quran in Surah Hajj, Ayah 27 says, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجْ Declare, announce, and invite the whole of mankind, O Prophet Ibrahim, O the last messenger. And once your declaration has gone out, there are those who are spiritually alive, they will listen. They are spiritually not blind, they will see the right path. And they will come to visit the house of God for Hajj. No, 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 no. The ayah says, يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرْ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجِّنْ عَمِيقٍ They will not come for hajj. They will come to you, the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And with you as the leader and the guide. You will practically practice and demonstrate and explain and they will follow. That's what will make the hajj sahih. And therefore, if you're going for ziyara first, it's very important to remember the validation of our hajj is based on our acceptance of the authority of the Prophet and whoever was appointed by the Prophet as the divine guide. And therefore, any ibadah, forget about hajj, any other ibadah, be it salah or sawm or zakat or any other ibadah, if it is not done by the authorization of the Holy Prophet and his appointed successors therefore becomes invalid. So it's interesting. Notice how Hajj becomes wajib gradually. 
Hajj becomes wajib after we've already been praying salah. So we've established communication with God, our creator. Hajj becomes wajib when, when we have enough funds. You can't go for hajj if there's zakat which is wajib on you. Or khums which is wajib on you. Alright, you say, I don't have those items on which zakat is wajib. But at least after the month of fasting, you must have paid zakat al fitr then you come for Hajj. And you must have fasted to spiritually develop yourself before you can come for Hajj. So spiritually develop yourself in fasting. Constantly pray and establish communication with the Creator. Show your compassion and mercy and care and concern for the needy through Zakat. After you do all these things, now come for Hajj. Which Hajj? The Hajj, which is with the guidance of the Holy Prophet and his appointed successors as your leader and your guide to show you how to do the proper Hajj. So Ziyara is very important, therefore. Of course, we can do Ziyara after the Hajj, doesn't matter. But our caravans have planned it in such a way that we shall do the Ziyara to Medina before the Hajj. Therefore, we remind ourselves that Medina is holy and blessed and sanctified because every place there, of course, every place of the old Medina, the Medina of the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, is the place where the Prophet migrated, he settled, he lived, and finally he died and he was buried there. So it's holy. In fact, uh, some scholars believe, believe that you will be buried in that land from whose earth you were created from. We are all created from the earth. But is there any way to know which part of the earth we will die so we will be buried in that part? According to some scholars, you get buried in that part of the earth from whose earth you were created. Which means it was the earth of Medina from which the physical part of the Prophet was created and therefore the earth of Medina is holy and blessed in that not only it interns and encloses the holy body of the Prophet but therefore that portion of the earth is blessed and Medina is holy because the Archangel Jibreel alayhi salam brought so many surahs to the Prophet in Medina. Surah Baqarah, Ali Imran, Nisa, Ma'ida, Surah Anfal, Surah Tawbah, Surah Hajj, Surah Nur, Ahzab, Shura, Surah by the name of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Surah Muhammad, and Fatih, and Hujurat, and Hadid, and Mujadala and Hashr and Mumtahana and Saf 61 and Jumu'ah 62 and Munafiqeen 63 and Taghabun 64 and Talaq 65 and Tahrim 66 and Jinn there's a Masjid Jinn there 72, 76 is Surah Dahr Mosque of Medina is another reason we consider the city as holy. The Mosque of Medina is a place where you go and pray and the thawab of prayer there is multiple times more than prayer anywhere else. So it's holy. Masjid Quba makes the city of Medina holy. Medina is holy, of course, after the Prophet, the Ma'asumin alayhim salam have been buried there, the holy lady Fatima and the four Imams of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Imam Al-Hasan and Imam Zainul Abidin and Imam Baqir and Imam Sadiq. Medina is holy because some of the best of the Ansars and the Muhajireen are also buried there. Medina is holy because Shuhada are buried, Sayyidu Shuhada Hamza of his time is buried there. Medina is holy because miracles were performed there. The Prophet lived there. People used to come with their problems to the Prophet. The Prophet would make dua and difficult problems were solved because of that. Sometimes incurable illnesses were solved and, and cured. Uh, 
those who were impoverished were provided for. It's a holy city because the power of God and the grace and the love of God showed itself in the holy city through the Prophet. And finally, of course, Medina is holy because just outside Medina is going to be the beginning of the Hajj in Masjid Shajara, which inshallah we will see later on. But one of the important duties we have to perform in Medina is prayer in the mosque of the Prophet, in addition to the ziyarah and the why of the ziyarah. I would like to remind ourselves about the importance of Salah in Masjid al-Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Of course, I will be basing it on the rulings of Marhum Ayatullah Al-Khoi Rahmatullah Alaihi and Hazrat Ayatullah Sistani May Allah protect our marajia And it, like I said, if anybody needs guidance according to any other mushtahid, please clarify and then I will present accordingly Masjid of Nabi لَمَسْجِدٌ أُسِّسَ عَلَى التَّقْوَى سورة توبة آية 108 مِنْ أَوَّلِ يَوْمٍ أَحَقْ أَنْ تَقُومَ فِيهِ The Quran says that masjid which was built on the foundation of purity and piety the mosque of the Prophet that is more deserving for you to pray rather than to go to that other mosque which was built by the munafiqeen who are not pure in their mind and in their intentions and in their behavior So we are in Medina and the opportunity is available to pray in the Masjid of the Prophet How many times should we go and pray there? According to one riwayah, the Holy Prophet says Man salla fi masjidi arba'ina salah Whosoever prays in my mosque, 40 prayers That's 5 times a day, 8 days La yafutuhu salah, and he doesn't miss even one of these forty prayers, then he will enjoy three benefits. Kutibat lahu number one baraatum min nar he will get immunity and protection from the fire of hell. Number two najatum min al azab protection even before the fire of hell, protection from the azab in the dunya, in the barzakh, in the akhirah. And number three. Bari aminan nifaq. He shall be protected from uh, weakness of faith or hypocrisy, which is no faith. Why is it? Why is it that prayers in the mosque of the Prophet can have so much effect? Perhaps, perhaps the reason is a person who prays frequently and regularly, his whole stay in Medina is structured around prayers everything else is secondary primary is prayer not at home not in the hotel not in the building in the masjid of the Prophet therefore this person is alert and therefore his faith is being strengthened by this conscious deliberate scheduling and planning of prioritizing God and the presence of the messenger of God and to pray in his mosque. So this has the effect of strengthening one's faith, which is the reason why the Prophet is saying that nifaq will be removed. And the constant regular prayer will therefore strengthen the determination to fight against temptations which say, oh, you're tired now. Oh, you've got some other more important work to do. No. These are evil temptations. Of course, there may be emergencies, there may be real priorities, you're excused. But false excuses, the determination to fight against them, therefore, is strengthened by the discipline to go to the mosque of the Prophet regularly. And that would therefore enable us to protect ourselves from the fire of hell. And the effect of being protected from punishment is because now, I'm not alone, I'm going to the mosque not to, the pray, to pray furada prayers, I'm going to the mosque to pray jama'ah prayers. So this congregation, assembly, solidarity, unity, that enables me collectively to be able to fight against the evil in society, which is the cause of adab that comes down to a family, to a person, to a nation, to a society. Of course, this was a, this was a rewire from the Sunni sources. In the Shia sources, how many prayers? No number has been specified. Should it be 40 prayers, less than 40, more than 40? The riwayah says, pray as much as you can. 
أكثروا الصلاة في هذا المسجد ما استطعتم as much as you can be it less than 40 be it more than 40 فإنه خير لكم definitely there is a lot of benefit but there is no hard and fast rule that it must be a particular number so now I want to go and pray in the masjid of the Prophet in the time of the Uthmani Ottoman Empire for example the Imam was the Hanafi Imam appointed by the Ottoman ruler now we have another madhab Imam leading the prayers incidentally this question is there amongst all the Sunni madhab can a Hanafi follow behind a Shafi'i Imam or a Shafi'i behind a Maliki Imam they've got their rules well likewise our Imams were asked alayhim wasalam can we pray behind the Imam of another madhab and the fatwa of the mujtahid is yes you can not only you can it is better better to go to the masjid and to pray behind the Imam of the masjid in fact if a person is in the masjid for the ziyarah and the time of salah arrives should he leave the masjid no the fatwa is no it's better not to leave the masjid at the time of salah according to some mujtahids marhum imam khomeini hazrat atla khamenei marhum atla fadil no it is haram to leave the masjid in the time of salah Hazrat Ayatul Sistani says, it is haram if it will cause a wrong impression. So you are known to be a follower of the madhab of Ahlul Bayt, and they see everybody else going into the masjid at the time of salah, and you are trying to escape and run away from the masjid. No, this is not only re reflecting negatively on you as a person, it's reflecting negatively on the madhab, and therefore it becomes haram secondarily. I wish to pray in the building. I was not there in the masjid at the time of salah, but uh, you're saying it's mustahab to go to salah. I wish not to go to the masjid. I want to pray for ada or jama'ah elsewhere. Maybe in another masjid, maybe in the building. The fatwa of the mujtahids is that if by praying jama'ah in your own building, you will give a wrong impression that the followers of the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt do not go for jama'ah prayers to the masjid, then it is not allowed. But if nobody is bothered, nobody is going to criticize, nobody is going to form a wrong impression, then it is allowed. Of course, Marhum Imam Khomeini, Hazrat Ayatullah Khamenei, no, they are of the opinion, even if it doesn't cause a wrong impression, still, it is not allowed to pray in the building. You should go to the masjid. If not the masjidul uh, nabi, at least the neighborhood masjid. The reason is simple. You all know the current crisis in Syria. The root cause, fitna, fitna. There is no respect, tolerance between Muslims for each other. Not only that, there's hatred. Not only hatred, now they're ready to kill each other. The solution is simple. We are brothers. All of us say, La ilaha illallah. Yes, we have differences. Keep the differences aside. Let's unite on the common platform. Where is the place where we are going to acquire and build that unity and cooperation and brotherhood? Masjid. Salah. So, not now, when this fitna was boiling, unfortunately it is still boiling in Iraq. At that time, our maraji, especially Hazrat Al-Fatihah Sistani, may Allah protect our maraji. He gave the message at that time, our ummah here and elsewhere is facing a great threat, which is breaking up the ummah. And therefore we need unity. And we can unite based on the common beliefs that we have. All of us believe in God, all of us believe in the Prophet, all of us believe in the Quran and the commonalities and therefore we can have respectful peaceful coexistence with each other we respect each other's faith you are with your differences I'm with my differences but let's unite on the common platform under no circumstance will I be allowed to violate the sanctity and the respect 
of a Muslim's property to go and damage it, of a Muslim's honor and prestige to abuse him and degrade him, and to accuse him wrongly, or God forbid to, to violate the sanctity of his life. Forget it as a Muslim, sanctity of life as a human being is haram. The last message of the last prophet in the last hajj was this. Haram from today till the end of time. The property of a Muslim on another Muslim. Haram means I'm not allowed to violate the sanctity. Haram the honor of a Muslim on another Muslim. Haram the life of a Muslim on another Muslim. We have to respect that. That was the last message. And that is the message we have to seek and practice in hajj as a step to solve the problems of the ummah. And therefore, this fatwa of the mujtahids is based on the guidance of the imams of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. Go and pray in the mosques of the Sunni brothers. Go and visit them if they're sick. Go and attend if somebody dies. Go and attend their funerals and pray with them and pray for them and uh, show your condolence and your cooperation. And if they are in need and they ask you for help, give them help as a neighbor, as a citizen. And show good neighborliness when you are staying with near each other. And if you have to perform your civic duties of, let's say, testifying in court, be ready to go and do so. Lakini. So I want to go and pray. But it's unavoidable. Forget the differences in the salah between the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt and the Sunni madhab. Amongst the Sunni madhabs themselves, they have differences. So differences are unavoidable. But the important thing is I need to recognize them. And then I need to see how I can accommodate those differences and pray together. So a quick reminder. There's a difference in the timing of the prayers. The Sunni brothers pray five times a day. Most of the Shia will pray three times a day. Difference number two, Adhan, you'll find that the Sunni Madhab gives an Adhan before the time of Fajr. Let's say an hour before Fajr. But that is for Tahajjud, they are waking up people for Sahr, to eat uh, Suhoor. Or they are waking up people for Salatun uh, Layl, for example. In the Adhan, you will see that they may not recite the Salawat, or they may not say the uh, expression of Wilaya, or they don't, they don't pronounce Hayya ala khayr al-amal. In fact, in Salatul Fajr, they add another expression, as Salatul Khayrun min al The manner in which, so the time is in and the Adhan has been made, so now you want to go for Salah and you notice that the manner in which the Wudu is done is also different. And then after the Wudu is done, you go into the Masjid, the prayer is not immediate, there's a gap. 15 minutes gap, for example, till the Salatul Jama'ah, Faridah, is established. The reason is because they pray the Mustahab Nawafil prayers. So appreciate why the difference is there. Um, you will notice that once the Salah is about to begin, that they will make sure that when they stand in the rows, that there should be no gap between two worshippers. Because they say that shaitan will come and fill that gap and cause distance between two brothers or two sisters uh, no, but no brother and sister the sisters have to stand behind the brothers in our madhab it is not haram to keep a gap a small gap of course a big gap disconnects a small gap less than a meter is allowed but it's makru it's better not to keep the gap so if that's the situation then uh, for the sake of unity we can act on the mustahab of re removing the gap um, delay we can also pray the mustahab nawafil prayers adhan appreciate why there are differences timing it's not that we're not allowed to pray five times in fact it is mustahab to pray five times if we also pray the nawafil so maybe we could change our lifestyle and try praying five times with the nawafil for example sometimes three times sometimes five times you will also notice that the imam 
in the loud prayers or even in the whisper prayers may not recite Bismillah. Again, there's a difference in opinion. Some of them say Bismillah is not part of the Surah. Some say, yes, it is part of the Surah, but you don't have to recite it loudly. According to the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt, Bismillah is part of the Surah. Mustahab to recite it loudly in the whisper prayers of Dhuhr and Asr. And wajib to recite it loudly, Bismillah, in the loud prayers of Fajr and Maghrib and Isha. You will notice also that when they're standing up, they pray with the hands closed. Incidentally, in their madhab, the Maliki madhab says that you pray with your hands open. The other madhab say it's better to, to close your hands. You will notice that as the Imam is reciting, the Ma'amum also, you'll notice, is beginning to recite Fatiha. The reason is because, again, different madhabs have different fatwas. The Maliki madhab says that you're allowed, even behind the Imam, to recite Fatiha and a Surah, in addition to what the Imam is reciting. Appreciate these things, because these are important as we go and pray together. You'll notice after completion of Fatiha, they will say loudly, Amin. Incidentally, all of the Mazahib say, Amin is not wajib. Malikis, in fact, say, it is not even mustahab to say Amin. So if you don't say Amin, you should know even amongst the Sunni brothers, there's a difference of opinion. Of course, the, Sh the Shia method of Ahlul Bayt is that Amin is not allowed. Because Amin is an extra word, and it's a prayer, and Fatiha is not a prayer. Fatiha is Qira'ah, it's Qur'an. Regarding recitation of the Surah after Fatiha, the Sunni Madhahib say you can recite any part of the Qur'an. A few verses from the Qur'an is valid. The Madhab of the Ahlul Bayt is Ihtiyat, Ihtiyat which is Wajib. There's no Mujtahid who gives a permission. Ihtiyat wajib is to recite the full surah. One mushtahid does say that it is ihtiyat mustahab. Therefore, you can skip the surah or recite part of the Quran. In sajda, you will notice that sometimes the imam will recite a surah which has a wajib sajda. Ayah, Surah Najm, for example, or Surah Iqra, or Surah Alif Lam Mim Sajda, or Surah Ha Mim Sajda. In the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt, it is haram to recite a surah which is a wajib sajda ayah, because Sababu, immediately the ayah is recited, you must go down into sajda. But then you're breaking the sequence of salah, because in Qiyam, you should go to Ruku'ah, and after Ruku'ah, you go to sajda. Now you have disturb the sequence, you've added a rukun, and this rukun is going to break the salah. So in case this situation arises, then therefore the salah is batil, you'll have to pray again. Sitting after the second sajda, before standing up for the next raka'ah, you'll notice that some of them don't do that, though interesting, it is sunnah amongst them to do so. But then some sunnis don't follow the sunnah, unfortunately. Qunut. The Hanafis and the Hanbali say, no, there is no Qunut in Salah. But the Malikis and the Shafi'i say, no, 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 there is Qunut, but only in Salatul Subh. And that also only after the Ruku'ah, not before the Ruku'ah of the second Raka'ah. You'll notice the differences in Tashahud. They have got a longer tashahud they recite. We also have a longer tashahud which is mustahab but not wajib. They may not recite salawat, especially on, if they do this not on Ali Muhammad alayhim salam. You'll notice during the shahada, there is the movement of the finger. But none of, them, none of these things are wajib. So even if you don't do it, nobody should raise an objection against you. And finally, the completion of salah. The salam is by... Uh, one salam is facing the qibla, second and third salam is by turning the face right and left. In our madhab, salam has to be towards the qibla. 
However, mustahab, to, with the corner of the eye to look to the right and corner of the eye to look to the left, but keeping the face turned towards the qibla. And finally, one very important rule, and that is the Sunni madhahib, they say that if somebody is praying, then to cross in front of that praying person is not allowed because now you are interfering and intervening between him and God. So in, in, the, in the Shia madhahib, it's makruh, it's not haram. And the reason is because Allah is closer to me than any other human being. So therefore, if it's makruh, we should respect others. Try to avoid walking in front of somebody else who's praying. Make sure you bypass and respect that person in his prayers. Finally, so now I know the differences, I respect the differences, but I will want to pray in such a way that my prayer is valid. Question. I make the knee of jama'ah in the masjid to pray behind this imam. Do I have to recite the Fatiha in the Surah? Yes, according to the Fatwa of Marhum Sayyid al Khoi and Sayyid Sistani. May Allah protect our Maraja and bless those who have passed away. It is wajib to recite Fatiha and wajib to recite the Surah after the Imam. Amongst the Sunni Madhab themselves, incidentally, there's a difference of opinion. The Hanafi says, no, you should not recite Fatiha and the Surah behind the Imam, neither in the loud prayers nor in the whisper prayers. The Maliki say, no, 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 you're allowed to. In the whisper prayers, you're allowed to recite the Fatiha and the Surah. The Shafi'i says, yes. And the Hanbali says, yes, only in loud prayers and only if you can't hear the Imam. So notice, even in their madhabs, some of them allow recitation of Fatiha and the Surah behind the Imam. So for us to recite Fatiha and Surah quietly behind the Imam should not be a problem. So you make the knee of Jama'ah, but the rules of Jama'ah will not apply. So we should recite the Fatiha and we should recite the Surah silently, even in the loud prayers. So if we can't recite loudly, we should at least recite slowly in whispers. Worst comes to worst, at least mentally. The only problem is the Friday prayer. I'll come to that later on. We have uh, four problems that can arise. And uh, the solution to the problem is, as far as the timing is concerned, Fajr time is the same, Dhuhr time is the same. Problem is the difference in the Maghrib time. The Sunni Madhahib say that Maghrib time is when the sun sets. The Madhab of the Ahlul Bayt salam, most, but not all, most of the Mujtahid say, Ihtiyat wajib, you must not pray Maghrib till the redness of the eastern part of the sky crosses the head and gets to the western side because the sun has set on the western side so it is already dark on the east so the redness once it crosses above the head because the sun has set now that's when the time for maghrib comes in that's the only problem lakini you will discover that by the time the adhan is given at sunset till the adhan finishes till that small gap between the adhan and the delay before the salah starts by the time Salah starts, you will notice, look out yourself at the sky, you will notice already darkness has set in on the eastern side. So you can join the Jama'ah of the Maghrib. The gaps, I'm reciting my own Fatiha, I'm reciting my own Surah, but the Imam is reciting a very long Surah. No problem, you recite your own Dhikr, you're allowed to make Dhikr after your Surah. Sajda, according to the method of the Ahlul Bayt, it's not allowed on anything which is worn, a cloth. Sajda is not allowed on anything which is edible. So carpet, it won't be allowed. But marble, yes, because marble is part of the earth. So if you can find a place in the masjid which is marble, wonderful. If you can't find the place, no problem. You can do it on the carpet for the sake of unity. 
And finally, I'm skipping the details, the rule of the wajib sajda. If the imam recites a surah in which sajda, wajib sajda, ayah is there, if you can make sajda by ishara, without going down into actual sajda, do so and your salah will be sahih. But if everybody else has gone to sajda, and you're the only one not going to sajda, no, you may go to sajda, break your salah, and then later on repeat your prayers. So, I have summarized our basic duty of ziyara and why Medina is holy and why we should do ziyara in the spirit of ziyara. And most important in Medina also is the uh, salah in the mosque of the Prophet, how to pray it in a proper way. And one final issue will be now the visit to the other historical places and the visit to Jannat al inshallah tomorrow. We'll continue on that. If there are any questions or clarifications, please. Yes, please. Yes. No, you don't have to repeat if you follow the procedure that I have outlined. So you make the knee of jama'ah, the time is already in. If you can find a place where you can make sajda on the marble, beautiful. If you can't, take your own musalla, which has a, a, a portion on it on which sajda is valid, let's say the dried leaves. If for some reason you will be uh, harassed because of this, no need to even to take that musalla, and you can't find a place on the marble, play on the, pray on the carpet, no problem. Recite the Fatiha, recite the Surah, no problem. Your Salah will be Sahih. Yes, please. From a particular door. Not necessary. Not necessary. But the problem is the choice right now. In order to control the flow of... Uh, traffic of the uh, visitors they have kept one door as an entry door and one door as the exit door so it would be therefore necessary to observe these rules for the sake of uh, convenience and comfort yes please sorry How do we pray qunut? No, qunut is mustahab according to the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt, number one. Number two, qunut, it's mustahab to raise the hands. So if you have finished the surah after in the second rak'ah and the imam is still continuing with the qira'ah, you can recite qunut without raising your hands, no problem. Yes, please. Question, the Imam is reciting a long surah after Fatiha. I've recited a short surah. Now, in order to fill the gap, am I allowed to recite the same surah a second time or even more? To recite a second surah is makru in ordinary circumstances. Makru. It's allowed, but makru here means you get lesser thawab. More thawab is only to recite one surah. However, because of the jama'ah, and because there is a gap now being introduced, as a jama'ah, you may not even be required to recite anything, just listen to the imam. But if you want to fill the gap, you can make dhikr, la ilaha illallah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la hawla wa la quwa, as many times. Or you make a dua, rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Or no, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Or no, recite the Quran, but with the niyyah that in salah, I'm allowed to recite Quran, which is not the wajib surah. I finished the wajib surah. I'm reciting extra Quran because I'm allowed to recite it. With that niyyah, it's okay. So you can recite Ayatul Kursi, for example. Or you can recite another short surah.
Let's pray to Allah for tawfiq to be able to be in the mental preparation for going to Hajj. We are already, whether we like it or not, we are already guests. We've been invited. Everything has been prepared for us. And therefore, for every step that we take now in preparing, we are getting the thawab of beginning our journey for Hajj, insha'Allah. And part of the preparation is to prepare for the ziyarah to Medina. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.